So it may refer to health and vigor that might be relinquished to a cruel enemy, perhaps an offended spouse. The Bible says that your years go to the cruel one. That means the best years. Possibly this person he's referring to is in the prime of life. And it would signify that those years could be productive. Uh, it could be referring to the years and what those years had produced. Uh, the prime of his life. When I was in my early 40s, I used to think, I'm at my prime. And now I feel so strong at 50, I feel I'm at my prime. And I guess if I live to my 60s, I'll fill him up my prime. But he can give his honor, his strength, his years, and his wealth. All that he had gained. The point is clear. The price of infidelity, here's the main thing, hear this. The price of infidelity is high. But everyone and everything, everything one works for, his position, his power, honor his prosperity the place God has put him all of that crumbles and so that's what you're robbed of now let me pose another question let me talk about what your rebellion causes in verse 11 the Bible says you will groan or it translates you will mourn at last the term used for groaning is of a poor and distressed person the verb conveys an animal cry of anguish when the guilty finds himself destitute. The picture is that of total exhaustion of the whole body, possible disease. Often the house of immorality, this is a one-liner, is the vestibule to the funeral home. Uh, it's leading us to believe that possibly this person has got into an immoral act and now has contracted a disease. And so he's groaning at last. His body is actually being destroyed. The Hebrew leads us to believe that in verse number 12 that he's actually posing sort of a question to himself that I've not obeyed my teachers. And it's as though it should start with saying, if only. So think about that in verse number 12. If only I had obeyed. You know, the Bible speaking of David, when David got in trouble uh, in the area of immorality, the Bible says that he was really supposed to be at war but he stayed home. I wonder if David ever sat around the castle and said, if only I had gone and done what I was supposed to be doing. And so in verse number 11, it says, when your flesh and your body are consumed, and I say, how I have hated instruction and my heart despised correction. The next word, it moves from the motivation. First, it gave me words of pre preventive prevention. Then it moved to words that motivate me to say, you ought to stay clean because there's a lot at stake you better consider the latter end. There is an, wait a minute, there is an afterwards. All right, then he says, but let's talk about satisfaction. Let's move to the positive side of what I've already given you, married man. Verse 15, drink water from your own cistern. I've got my whale here with me tonight. She travels with me over here. Running water from your own well. Now listen to this. This is Hebrew poetry. So listen to this. Some of you men want to always wanted to read poetry to your wife. You can go home and read this to her tonight. I guarantee you, Scott, what will. God's provision for satisfying. And here's what it is. It's God's provision for satisfying sexual desires in marriage. Fidelity. Here it is. It simply tells us to satisfy, our, listen to these words, our legitimate sexual thirst in a legitimate way. That's exactly what that verse is saying. The image of a cistern and well are used of a wife because she, like water, satisfies our desire. What's, there's nothing too hard to understand. Then he moves in verse 16 and 17. He says, should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the street, let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. It is saying it, you shouldn't be taking the, the water, the fountains that God's giving you for your wife out into the streets but you ought to keep it at home here's one fair uh, paraphrase drink from your own cistern drink fresh water out of your own well are you to seek your pleasure here and there and drink them in the streets have them at home never share them abroad that's fidelity now he moves in this satisfaction is a wonderful passage he moves from from fidelity to fondness. 
verse 18 and 19. Let your fountains be blessed. Rejoice with the wife of your youth as a loving deer and a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured or intoxicated with her love. He's saying that the proper course of action is to find pleasure in a fulfilling marriage. For the fountain to be blessed indicates that sexual delight is God-given. Sexual delight is God-given. Therefore, we should rejoice in the wife who has from the vigor of youth shared the excitement and satisfaction, the joy and the contentment of a divinely blessed sexual relationship. The Bible says that as a married man, I'm to be intoxicated, infatuated, captivated, well, where's the organ? <laughs> Those words just started moving. With my wife's love. In other words, it's really talking about the fact that you're so satisfied with your spouse's love, why would you need to go anywhere else to seek any type of fulfillment? Why would you need a graphic design? Why would you need a shadow of the real thing on a computer screen when you got the substance of the real thing in your arms? That's what he's saying. And he's trying to get our attention on being captivated. Now, listen to this statement. This was a marvelous statement. The adulterer watches the river turn into a sewer, but the faithful husband sees the water become wine. That's a great statement. Be intoxicated with her love. It's as though you, and that's the word that's used for getting high on your spouse. Warren Wiersbe said this. I think it's significant that Jesus turned water into wine at the wedding feast as though he was giving us an object lesson concerning the growing delights of marriage. That is a fabulous statement. So if the husband and wife love each other and seek to please each other and the Lord, their relationship will be one of deepening joy and satisfaction and they won't look around for anyone else. Now, let me move quickly to foolishness. Foolishness, verse 22, 23. For why should you, my son, he says again, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in arms seductress? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord. He ponders all his path. His own iniquity entrapped the wicked man. He's caught in the cords of his sin. This is the last thing I'm going to deal with. He shall die for lack of instruction. Into the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. He warns you. He tells you the pleasure he's already given you. He motivates you with this truth of what you'll lose if you make bad choices and choose not to obey God. And then he tells you the absolute satisfaction you can enjoy in a relationship that is honoring the Almighty God. And then he comes back and he says, I want to just close by reminding you again how foolish you would be to go against my motivation and my satisfaction. So in verses 20 through 23, he's talking about foolishness. See, freedom of choice is one of the privileges God has given us. But he instructs us and urges us to use that freedom wisely. At verse 22 in the NIV, New International Version reads, the evil do deeds of a wicked man ensnare him. The cords of his sin hold him fast. Someone said that if they were going to write an epitaph for Samson, for Judges 13 through 16, it would be verse number 22 of Proverbs 5. One of the deceitful things about sin is that it promises freedom, but it only brings slavery. How many of you know that sin never provides what it promises? The Bible says in, Pro, in Romans 6, 16, do, not, do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are the one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. So the, here's a great one-liner. The cords of sin get stronger the more we sin. Yet sin deceives us into thinking we're free and we can quit sinning whenever we please. Verse number 20 is a rhetorical question. Why should my son, you my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman, be embraced in the arms of a seductress? It doesn't need an, an answer. The answer is obvious. And so it's rhetorical. As the invisible chains of habit are forged, we discover to our horror that we don't have the strength to break them. So now the cords are there. And the more you sin, the stronger the cords become. So now you have a stronghold. So it's wrapped you up, tied you up. So are you in bondage and seeking deliverance tonight? Kept hidden, kept hidden. When you keep it undercover, 
come to church with the outward expression that everything's well, when you know on the inside you're full of dead men bones. Kept hidden, it grinds on the spirit and conscience of those who practice it until exposure seems a kind of relief. Many of persons have deliberately left traces of a sin for others to discover as a desperate plea for rescue from enslaving behavior because no one can stand the pressure of living a double life but for so long. And you know, there's nothing in the world more freeing than authenticity in Jesus Christ. You don't feel like you have anything to prove. You don't have anything you have to show off about. You're just who you are. You're, you're happy, you're free, and it's just such joy and such delight. Thank God for Jesus Christ making that possible. So as a desperate plea for rescue from the saving sin, you come to realize that only one can set you free. And it may seem like a simple solution and antidote, but John 8, 36 is still the only truth I know to share. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. You, you begin to put your focus only on God's Son, the Lord Jesus, and realize apart from Him, there's absolutely no one or nothing that can free you. Thank God for the satisfaction of a good marriage. And if you're single, that's what you would desire. It's a satisfying. You would be want to be in love with someone that you feel the truth of God's word motivated them to stay pure, that they considered the when it's over, they considered the end in mind, and it was a motivating force, and they realized the foolishness of not enjoying what they wanted in the first place and God gave them, and that is the person they're married to. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for our time together. Speak into our hearts. Continue to deal with us in the area of unforgiveness. And even tonight, the fidelity that you've called us to in our marriages. Help us to be faithful men and women. And Lord, I'm wise enough, been here long enough, know enough people personally. There are some men here that would give anything to have a faithful wife. And there are some women here that give anything to have a man that's intoxicated by their love. That had eyes only for them that love them as the doe and the deer of their life, a playful yet mature, loving relationship. God, I pray that you would keep us faithful to you because you are the one who promises. And though we're faithless, you remain faithful. To that faithful man, that faithful woman, give them patience to wait on your best and keep them hopeful that you're going to do the miraculous in their life. In Jesus' name.